Hi everyone and welcome to our online service. It's so wonderful to have you join us today. As we begin our time together, let's look to the Word of God and let it refresh us today. In Isaiah 40, 28 to 31, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us together. We come before you now with songs of praise and adoration. We give you thanks that you are the everlasting God that refreshes and strengthens us. As we raise our voices in worship, we declare that you are the God that does not grow tired or weary. In your understanding, no one can fathom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi everyone, let's lift our voices and celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, our beautiful Saviour, Amen!
Yes, Lord, today we remember your birth. Remember, we remember your coming to the earth as our Savior, as our Redeemer. You are worthy, Lord. We adore you. We adore you.
God of all majesty, risen King, Lamb of God, holy and righteous, blessed Redeemer, bright morning star.
Thank you, worship team, for leading us into that powerful time of worship. Moving on to our announcements. This December, Ask Pastor Derek, our monthly Q&A on Facebook Live with Pastor, will be taking a break. The sessions will resume in January 2022 on the last Wednesday of every month. Please keep your questions coming via Facebook Messenger and email and Pastor will do his best to answer them in the new year. Next weekend, we are privileged to have Pastor Israel Pokta come bring us the Word of God at our Christmas service. So remember to invite your friends and family to join us next week to listen to a word right out of Israel. Now, let's ready our hearts to receive the word with this song. When you speak, when you speak, confusion fades. Just a word. Suddenly I'm not afraid, cause you speak. Freedom reigns. There is hope. In every single word you say I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak Quiet my heart and listen in When sorrows Sorrows roll, and troubles ring. You whisper peace when I don't have the words to say. I won't lose hope when storms won't break. You keep your word. Oh, your promises will keep me safe. I don't wanna miss one word. life to me Oh, I don't want to miss one word you speak Oh, quiet my heart and listen in Sing your way Ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Oh, I don't want to. You speak everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my heart, I'm listening. Quiet my heart. Quiet my heart, I'm listening. Sing quiet my heart. Hi everybody, it's great to see you online again. We trust that uh, even uh, this past week, the hand of the Lord has been upon you. His protection is with you. His provision has been abundant in your life. Let's now read together from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. Together, let's go. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, 
Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said. For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. He went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with a child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord has spoken through the prophet, I call my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. A British psychologist by the name of David Lewis reports that shopping is hazardous to the health of men. He tested uh, volunteers from 22 to 79 years old by sending them out to do Christmas shopping. He recorded blood pressure rates that, according to his report, you expect to see in a fighter pilot going into combat. According to this same test, only one in four women showed any significant signs of stress from shopping. This familiar Bible, Bible story tells the account of wise men looking for Jesus. What would have happened if there had been wise women <laughs> instead of wise men? Well, the answer is that they would have asked for directions immediately upon commencing the trip, which would have allowed them to arrive on time. And they would have helped Mary deliver the baby clean up the stable, bake a birthday cake and knitted cute little outfits for Jesus to wear. But jokes aside, last week I spoke about the road of wisdom. And as a follow-up, I felt it's important that we learn more about these people called the Magi and receive God's truths through them. In some translations, they are called wise men. Why were these guys called wise men? So my sermon today is, what makes wise men wise? Shall we say that together? What makes wise men wise? So first of all, who were they? Where were they from? Well, many theories were written about them. Uh, they were devoted to the study of the stars, so they were either astronomers or astrologers, but more than that, we cannot really be certain. Others added that they were descendants of Jews who were ex exiled to those places and then did not return to Israel. I would like to propose that they came from the area of Persia, what is Iran today. They were called Magi, which is an ancient Iranian word from where we get the word magician. A tradition has also given them names, uh, Melkor, Beltazar, and Kaspar. Uh, the three names were concorded because there were three 
gifts. So there was a belief that there were three of them because there were three sets of gifts. But we really don't know the actual number who came to Bethlehem. It could, they may even have an entourage that came with them. I want to submit to you that the Magi were actually prophetic men, prophetic people from Iran of Persia who came from a line of believers dating all the way back to Daniel, Sedrach, Meshach and Abednego from the book of Daniel. Now let's get back to our question. What makes wise men wise? The world today desperately needs wise men, needs wisdom. Now today we have many highly educated and knowledgeable people. There are many institutions of higher learning and research. Universities have faculties dedicated to the study of many fields of knowledge. It's all good, but there's no faculty of wisdom in any university. And there is a great difference between being educated and being wise. They may be connected. Wisdom and knowledge and study are definitely connected, but they are not the same. It is good to be educated and knowledgeable, but God wants us to be wise. This is what God says about wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honour. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. You know, the Bible tells us here that wisdom personified here yeah, as, a, as a lady uh, is full of goodness. Wisdom is invaluable, very precious. Money cannot buy. And with wisdom, every good thing follows. So God wants you and I to have wisdom. In fact, he specifically tells us to ask him for it. In James chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, read together. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God invites us to ask for wisdom because it's so valuable. But what is wisdom? Well, here's the definition, okay? My personal definition of wisdom is that it is applied understanding that works. Okay, repeat that. Applied understanding that works. So wisdom is both intellectual and practical. Wisdom begins with understanding. True learning is founded on understanding. It starts with understanding. And then it is applicable. So wisdom brings solutions for the problems we face day by day. My prayer for you today is that you will want to be a wise man, a wise person, and follow the footsteps of the people we are studying today. I want to touch on four things that make wise men wise. The first is, they want to know. They want to know. You know, there are many theories about the star that we read in the, in the scripture. Some people suggested it may have been a comet, you know, this flashing uh, uh, things that fly across the night sky. Others think that it was a star that went nova. Uh, the word nova means a star showing a sudden large increase in brightness and then slowly returning to its original state over a few months. A third theory is that there was a special alignment of the planets. However, if any one of these theories were correct, then many people would have seen the phenomenon. The point here is that only these few men bothered to search further. You know, many people see things, 
even spectacular things and may be even outwardly impressed. But often, their expression of amazement or, 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 or wonder is pretty superficial because after that, they don't take any trouble to find out more. Compare them, compare the wise men to the chief priests and the teachers of the law that we read about. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, when, he, when Herod had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Now these were the top religious leaders of the day. They have the prophecy in their hands and could even quote it by heart. But they did little to find out more. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says there, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God, had, God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. God says here that He's given to the whole of mankind enough light, enough evidence from the things He has created. But He says, we need to see beyond the visible to perceive that which is invisible. The visible, the physical, are like the sign, okay? And behind the physical is the invisible, which demonstrated his power and his reality. Many people say they want to know, but they don't go far enough. They just look at the physical and, then phys and, and, and superficially felt that they have uh, learned enough. Many people know enough to believe there's a God, but they won't go further to find out which God and what the real God is like, the true God is like, and what the real God has done. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, God says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God is saying here that to know him, to find him, to really have the truth, we need to seek him with all our heart. This means that there must be a sincere desire to know. The religious leaders were able to advise the Magi where to go and find this promised king. But they did nothing about it themselves. Isn't that strange? They, of all the people in Israel, right, should be excited about this star because they're the people who are waiting for the Messiah. They should also be the first to go with the Magi to look for this promised king. You see, you can be religious. One, pers uh, one can be religious and still be insincere, superficial, and spiritually blind. Only a wise person really wants to know. Secondly, the, wise, the second characteristic of the wise man, what makes people wise, is that they know who and what to listen to. Shall we say that together? Know who and what to listen to. Another outstanding character trait that makes out a wise person is this. Yeah? He or she seems to know who to trust and who not to trust. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 7 to 8, Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. Herod declared himself to be a fellow seeker and worshipper. However, his reputation preceded him. I mentioned this last week, but let's recap. Herod the Great, as he became known in history, was a puppet king of Judea under the Roman Empire. He lived from 72 BC to 4 BC. The territory under him is referred to as the Herodian Kingdom. He is known for his wonderful colossal building projects throughout Judea, 
including the renovation of the second temple in Jerusalem and the expansion of the Temple Mount and the construction of the fortress at Masada. But as is common among kings and rulers, Herod was an obsessively insecure man. He was only a little bit more extreme than others. He killed his mother. He killed one of his wives. He murdered his own three sons when he suspected they wanted his throne. And he said, he gave an order, just before I die, massacre every nobleman in Jerusalem. Because I know when I die, nobody will mourn. Nobody will mourn for me, but I like to have some people mourning even if they are not mourning for me. He's that kind of man. You know, it's easy for us to be impressed by and even become beholden to powerful people in high places. But not so the wise men. The Magi listened to Herod. They followed some of his instructions, but not all of it. And being aware of his murderous reputation, they were cautious in their regard for him. They possessed this wonderful but rare ability to discern who and what to trust. This is so desperately needed today, isn't it? Who do we trust? What do we trust? What does a trustworthy person look like? Let's, let's, let's do a little quiz here. What does a trustworthy person look like? Can you name one thing you look for to see if someone is trustworthy? What would be the one thing you look for to see if somebody is trustworthy? Put that in the comment box. Name one thing you look for to see if someone is trustworthy. Put it in the comment box and post it. Let's have a little engagement here. Are you done? You know, in my research for this sermon, I found some traits of a trustworthy person. Let me share them with you, okay, and see whether uh, your answer uh, fits in with what I have found. The first one is being consistent, consistency. Uh, a, a trustworthy person displays some, the same behavior and language in any situation. It follows through on what they say they'll do. Consistency. Secondly is compassion. They can think well of others and don't consider themselves more important than anyone else. And thirdly, they have boundaries. And they don't try to impose their will on others. They don't feel the need to control people around them. And they avoid bullying. And accept a no means no. And if you say no to them, they will accept it. They won't try to manipulate you. Number four, this is the fourth trait. They don't expect something for nothing. They're willing to give a little to get something back later. And when they do ask for something, they try to show you the value of their request. Number five, a fifth trait of uh, somebody who can be trustworthy is being respectful of others. They will do their best not to be late. <laughs> In other words, they respect people's time. Yeah? Or cancel plans at the last minute that would inconvenience you. They also don't rush or drag things out for their own benefit. Their language is generally polite, encouraging, even empowering. A sixth trait that I've come across is gratitude. Yeah, a, a trustworthy person is grateful for other, what other people does for them. They give, and then they give credit where it's due, even if it means that they don't advance or get promoted or shine. Uh, seventh trait is that they value truth. They won't lie or fudge data. They give information even when that information is disadvantageous or could create conflict because they believe Conflict can be resolved with good empathy and communication. An eighth trait, they're vulnerable. You want to know whether a person is trustworthy is whether they are vulnerable. 
whether they will confide in you by exposing their own faults. They are willing to let you know that they are weak. Then number nine, a nine trait. They put people before things, willing to sacrifice to help others. And yet, they themselves demonstrate stability uh, in the financial and emotional area. And uh, ten trait, <laughs> of course, often right. They do their homework, they research, and, and, and what they speak, their opinions, uh, based on verifiable uh, research and that lead to verifiable conclusions. So they have a track record of having the right answer. Well, this is often what we look for, right? If the guy is often wrong, you don't want to trust him, right? You, you be careful about trusting the person who's not right, more right than wrong. The 11th trait is, of course, humility. Now, open to information that showed that he himself could be wrong understands and expresses the fact he doesn't have all the answers. And then number 12, connected. This is quite important, you know. He's connected to people and he tries to connect you. Shows that you are important to him and he wants your success. The more of his people you know, the more likely he's not hiding about who he is. Well, these are some of the traits uh, in people that are trustworthy. And they're all found in the Bible, by the way. Now, God has given us a manual to make us wise. Okay? And it's in Psalm 19, verse 7, shall we read? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making, everybody say, wise the simple. The Word of God can make us wise. If you want wisdom, you can experience wisdom, you can gain wisdom when you put God's Word into practice. Not just leaving it in your head, you must put it into practice. It will make you wise because, because wisdom is what? Wisdom is understanding yeah, that is practical, yeah, that works. It, it, it works. It, you have to apply it. Wisdom is not just knowledge. That's the difference. And thirdly, wise men are wise because they are open to the supernatural. And two incidents in this passage show that. They followed the star, first of all, which is a supernatural phenomenon, and they obeyed God when they had this dream from the Lord. To be open is not just merely giving mental assent. A lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I believe. I, I believe in the supernatural. <laughs> yeah. It's not just giving mental assent. That's the start. The Magi took risks to come all the way from a long distance. It caused them to, the, to leave the comfort of their homes. They have to brave the dangers of robbers and bandits on their journey. The travel in those days are never safe. Many Christians say they are open they are open to the Holy Spirit, but they would avoid and even oppose spiritual phenomena like speaking in tongues, healing, and casting out demons. Now, I'm not saying that every dream or phenomenon automatically means something supernatural took place. But a wise person will not close himself to this means of communication from God. Staying expectant to the supernatural is living in awe of God. And we realize that the supernatural realm is far greater and more real than the material realm. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 33, it says here, the fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom and humility comes before honor. The fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom. The word fear comes from the Hebrew word yira. It's an act of speech showing profound reverence toward a superior, a sense of awesomeness that causes wonder and astonishment. It's not a kind of a cringing, you know, uh, 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 fearfulness that, uh, that can actually uh, trap you or, or paralyze you. Now, this is an, a sense of awesomeness 
you, we, we, think, we think of God, we're conscious of God, and every time we think of Him, we're conscious of Him, that He's, first of all, He's always around, yeah, and He's omnipotent, He can do anything, and He is holy beyond measure. So that sense of awe, as a Christian, you know, we, because we, we live in the presence of God, there must always be this sense of awe and, and wonder and astonishment, looking to Him, to work on behalf of us. That's the kind of fear the Bible talks about that brings a man wisdom, that teaches a man wisdom. And it is that humility before the Lord uh, that will bring a person into honour. So that's the third aspect of what makes a wise person wise. The fourth and the last is that they are worshippers. Yes, and it relates of course to the fear of the Lord, the awe of God, the worshipping of God, believe it or not, can bring wisdom to people. Matthew 2 verse 11 and verse 12. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. The Magi worshipped, and they worshipped extravagantly. They didn't come empty-handed. They brought gifts of gold, incense, or frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts were profoundly symbolic, prophetic, and practical. First of all, gold. The scarcity and immense value of gold associated it with royalty. By bringing gold, the wise men considered Jesus as their king. Secondly, frankincense. Frankincense is an aromatic gum resin uh, used widely in parts of the Middle East and Africa. And it's produced by scraping the bark of certain species of trees and then harvesting the beads of resin when they're dried. Then when they're burned, okay, it creates a strong and beautiful aroma. It's also a very costly product. In fact, in the book of Exodus, chapter 30, verses 34 to 35, the Lord said to Moses, gather fragrant spices, resin droplets, molux shell, and galbanum, and mix these fragrant spices with pure frankincense, weighed out in equal amounts. Using the usual techniques of the incense maker, blend the spices together and sprinkle them with salt to produce a pure and holy incense. This is a, a recipe given by God to uh, God's people, to Moses, yeah, to produce this, this beautiful perfume mixed with pure frank incense. And it was the only incense permitted to be used at the altar of God. So burning frank incense was associated with worship. And the gift from the Magi, this gift from the Magi, acknowledged the presence of divinity in Jesus. So they prophetically right, know that they're coming to divinity, to God. The third gift is myrrh. Myrrh is a fragrant spice, again derived from the sap of a tree native to the Middle East. Like frankincense, it can be used as an incense, but in the ancient world, it also has a wider usage in perfume, and a, a part of anointing oil, and could even be imbibed as a medical tonic. Now, how is this gift of myrrh related to the life of Jesus? First of all, in Mark chapter 15, verses 22 to 24, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. Here we read that myrrh was offered to Jesus just before the soldiers struck the nails 
into his wrists. So they were using it as some kind of anesthetic to ease the excruciating pain they know they will inflict on the victim. So it was some kind of a anesthetic. Then in John chapter 19, 38 to 40, we read there that Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. And when Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfume ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. So here, myrrh was used for the embalming of the body of Jesus. So the gift of myrrh brought by the wise men was an expression of the prophecy that Jesus would be a suffering and a dying saviour. So wisdom of the Magi was proven by the gifts, the purpose of the gifts they brought, even though they have never met him. The incense symbolized his divine status. The myrrh is impending suffering and death for the salvation of mankind. And then besides expressing the kingship of Jesus, the goal had a practical purpose. It became necessary when they had to flee to Egypt. Remember at the end of that passage in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, uh, when the wise man had gone, yeah, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a, in a dream. Get up, the angel said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So the Holy Family needed the goal to live as refugees in a foreign land. What? makes wise men wise. Those are the four things. Let's, as we go into this Christmas time, yeah, ask for wisdom as that Christmas gift from our Heavenly Father. Yeah, let's, as we go into 2022, let's long for the wisdom of the Lord to be in our lives to rule our thoughts and our decisions. It's invaluable, priceless. God wants you to have it. Let's be like the Magi. They want to know. They know who and what to listen to. They are open to the supernatural. They live in awe of God. And then finally, they are true worshippers. Worshippers in spirit and in truth. Thank you for this wonderful thing called wisdom. It comes only from the Lord through His Word. But we need to have the posture, the posture of the wise man who knew how to become wise. Let us pray together. So let's open our hearts to the Lord. Yeah, let's activate within us a strong desire to have this wisdom that characterize the lives of these Magi. Let's ask for that. Let's humble ourselves. Let's say to the Lord, Lord, I'm just like a little child. There's so many things about this world that I cannot understand. There's so many problems that I have no answer to. But thank you, Lord, you say in your word that if anyone lacks wisdom, he can ask and you will give liberally. And so for this Christmas, dear Father, Give me this present, this Christmas present. 
call wisdom. And as I go into the new year, in the days ahead, may I be like those wise men you have shown us in your word. Eager to know knowing who to listen to, what to believe, what not to believe. Willing to make those sacrifices so that we can enter into a relationship with you, to take those steps that will not just rely on intellectual knowledge, but, in, but based on a deep relationship with you and your word. And that we'll be open, live in awe of you, conscious of who you are. Thank you, Lord. And be true worshippers of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray for all my brothers and sisters, all those who are hearing this sermon now and in the days to come, that indeed they will receive the longing of their hearts. Because I know, Lord, you love to answer this prayer, that your people be endowed with wisdom from on high. We're even way beyond the years, if there are young people here, you know, that I pray that they will begin to exhibit and manifest wisdom beyond their years as they relate to people all around them. Thank you, God, that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. like you we 
you worship you, oh God, in your holy name. Holy sin. Holy, holy, God Almighty. There is none like you. Holy, holy, God Almighty. Pastor Derek for that very insightful word. I believe that we have gained a deeper understanding of what wisdom looks like and how we can apply it in our lives. Let us never forget that the Word of God is our manual of life. Let's be wise and follow it and discover His purpose for our lives. I pray that as we unravel its truths, we will experience the Lord in supernatural ways that will transform our lives and impact those around us powerfully. We have come to the end of our service. If you are in need of prayer or need to speak to someone, there will be a QR code after the blessing song that will link you to our Zoom prayer room. Our ministry leaders will be there to pray with you. Once again, thank you for joining us today and see you again next week. Have a blessed week. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. And be gracious unto you, the Lord lift up His confidence on you. On you.